oftentimes the culture that you live in is hard to see from within it. And sometimes the people that are able to uh, most accurately describe the way a culture operates are foreigners or people coming from outside the culture that can see the dis distinctive elements of the culture itself. One of the most important and uh, definitive works ever written about American society was written by a foreigner, written by a guy by the name of uh, Alexander de Tocqueville. And Tocqueville was a French aristocrat, he was a Catholic aristocrat from Normandy, who visited the US in 1831 and came here actually to uh, explore prison reform. And he was interested in prisons because he thought Americans had this bizarre uh, interest in reforming people. In, in, in Europe, they just uh, locked people up and threw away the key. And this idea of somehow transforming the morality of people was just shocking to him. And so this already says something about American culture, this idea of self-improvement, and also the idea that, that once you've once you've done something horrible, that you could be redeemed, which has a kind of a religious element to it, this idea that you can kind of come back from something bad, but also the sort of self-transformative element of the culture itself. Now, what was interesting here is that, that uh, Tocqueville ultimately uh, wasn't so compelled by prison reform as he was by the culture itself. He, he spent most of his time in the Northeast um, and arrived at a time in the 1830s when the entire culture and society was in the process of tremendous transformation. Now, this period of transformation is broadly called the market revolution or the period of Jacksonian democracy. And those of you who've taken presidency or know anything about uh, Andrew Jackson, Andrew Jackson becomes president in 1828 uh, and is going to define in many ways, both personally and through his political style, the, the kind of elements of this new popular democracy. So obviously the, the things that are going to define the society at this time, remember we're talking about the 1830s now into the 1840s, um, is going to be absolutely tremendous population growth. This happens not only on the East Coast as cities begin to develop, but also as, as huge numbers of people begin to head out to the frontier. And the frontier itself is going to be very uh, very democratic because all of the old systems of, of, of social hierarchy uh, begin to break down. So this breakdown of aristocratic culture, if you think about it, we were talking a lot about democracy and then Jefferson and Hamilton and all these guys were talking about democracy, but they were part of a, of a effective aristocracy. I mean, they were part of an upper class uh, that dominated in the cities of, of, uh, of the East Coast. Um, and people like Jefferson and the plantation culture, I mean, this, this was not really a democratic society at all. However, in the 30 to 40 years after the revolution, uh, you begin to have, as a result of all of this movement, uh, uh, not just a highly mobile population, but also an increasingly democratic one. So democratic culture, uh, really the, the culture of democracy, we were the first democratic culture in the world. And we still have a culture which is defined by democracy, whether you want to look at uh, the, the Trump demographic, uh, this idea of, of uh, the common man uh, as, as something that sort of defines who we are, for better or for worse. Now, this is interesting because, again, while the two-party system in politics had always existed, there were the Federalists and uh, the Democratic Republicans back during uh, the time of Washington. Those parties began to break down as the Federalist Party, which the, which the party of these aristocrats began to disintegrate along with the hierarchy that was part of it. Uh, there emerged just a Democratic Party. So in, in a way, there was just this party of democracy, um, which Jackson kind of epitomized. Uh, and then there's going to be a response to it in, in, in another party called the Whig Party, which is going to be more of a religiously based party, one that where, where actually women are going to have more of a say on things. It's important to mention that this period also, while it is a democratic uh, period, is also very much a democracy limited to white property owning men. Uh, women were, were certainly part of the society, but, but not part of the civic or public part of the society. They were much, or they were pushed aside. Um, they were very much part of the church element and the moral element of the, of the society. But, uh, Tocqueville is, is fascinated by, by what he sees as this, as this sort of um, no-holds-barred male sphere. 
in the public realm. Obviously, this is also a period where, where slavery is going to be um, becoming more and more uh, restrictive and harsh in the South. And Tocqueville doesn't travel in the South, so he doesn't see that element of it. He's aware that slavery exists, but he's, he's really looking at white democracy as it kind of uh, comes into full flower. Now, what's interesting about this is, is in the middle of this period, you also have this incredible burst of religious involvement. And, and so essentially almost everyone in the United States was involved in some sort of religious movement, whether it was building a church or whether it was you know, coming back to Jesus. And there's going to be a lot of religion in the public sphere. Uh, and that's going to be a very, very dominant part of American culture for pretty much the next hundred years. That's going to start to decline in the in the 1920s as you get to you know modernization and, and, and modern America in a different way, but through the 19th century we're, we were one of the most religious uh, industrialized nations in the world. Now the, the other aspect of this is is there's going to be a lot of internal improvements. If you look at the picture in the upper right here, the Erie Canal, um, these sorts of things that the the uh, roads, Boston Post Road, and the roads that get built across. Uh, towards the frontier are going to be major avenues for not just trade, but uh, but people. And as as that happens, those those social networks um, in the East Coast, which were, were dominated by the by the, the hierarchy, begin to break down. So what's important about this is as as the democracy becomes more robust, um, the suffrage also becomes much more um, robust in the sense that this is, again, white men voting in very large percentages. So if you look at it uh, in the elections in the 1830s, you have over 80 uh, percent voter involvement, which is extremely high. And uh, even at the local level, lots of civic participation. So Tocqueville comes into this world and begins to look at what he sees around him. Now, obviously, this is a capitalistic world, and, and he sees democracy driving that capitalism. So this incredible drive for material gain uh, and this American interest in basically the way that you judge a life is how much money a person is able to make. So if there's ever a period where meritocracy was actually possible, at least for white people, it was in this period. Uh, Andrew Jackson himself kind of embodied that uh, that ability to kind of make it up from nothing. Um, but as you begin to see this 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 early capitalist society uh, evolving, uh, Tocqueville was shocked about Americans basically judging how good something is by how how well it sells. And you see this today in things like you know how many views does a video have or or, or, or does does a post on social media have. It's not how good the actual thing is. It's not about the quality of the thing. It's just simply if it has more uh, likes or if it has more views, uh, if you want to think about it that way, that's kind of like the selling of that idea. That's what ha gives it value, not its actually inherent value, which I think is really interesting. So there's a, the, not just the erosion of predetermined social classes, um, but you also have this kind of society of individuals, right? Very much people just defining themselves separate from everybody else. And that's why the church becomes so important is the thing that kind of holds the community together. So Tocqueville is, is just shocked by this idea of what he calls restlessness in the middle of prosperity. That as soon as somebody makes some money, all they do is they compare themselves to everyone around them uh, who has a little bit more. So this obsession with, with upward mobility is in part driven by jealousy. It's driven by the fact that at least in England and, and in France, you know, you didn't have to compare yourself to anyone outside of your social class. If you were middle class, you just were middle class. You didn't, there wasn't this kind of obsessive upward mobility and um, emphasis on, on uh, meritocracy. Um, there was a lot more pressure in the United States for this kind of, um, for this kind of uh, mobility. So. This ge geographic mobility, and that refers to you know, moving um, either to the frontier or into the city, uh, the, this leads to highly fluid uh, societies where not everybody knows each other. So you're, you're dealing with trying to figure out who people are on the fly. So these open and frank uh, social exchanges, which he sees, you know, again, Americans, you know, they don't know how to use the silverware on the table. Um, they very quickly talk to each other as if they've known each other for a long time. There's a sort of a lack of formality. 
which still, if you think about it, uh, defines American um, exchange. I mean, if you, if you are overly polite, uh, you can be seen as maybe being a little snobby or if you're going to put too much emphasis on the way that you use your silverware, it says something about your upbringing. Um, and Americans generally, particularly at that time and even up to today, um, don't necessarily want to present themselves as having more class status than, than somebody else. So that underlying restlessness, again, Tocqueville really focuses on that as well. And then the other thing that Tocqueville sees is this incredibly active uh, life of uh, po political life at the local level. So this is a time when you know everybody's reading a newspaper and everybody's got their newspaper. And it's, it's fascinating because just like you see social media today creating kind of conformity of ideas within certain groups, you had the same thing that everybody from a certain political party would read uh, the same newspaper. Everybody would be in the same club and the same association, whether whether this was about, you know, uh, trying to build, you know, uh, lecture series for your town or or uh, trying to build a new church. Um, the 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 intense activism of political life at the local level was something that really sh shocked and, and, and impressed Tocqueville. And it's still true. If you look at where Americans are most active, it really is at the local level. We, we're, we're interested in national politics, but um, people get much more involved at the level of the school, the level of the community, you know, whether it's anything from, you know, club athletics to all kinds of other things. So the other thing that happens here is, again, the, the, the idea of voluntary societies, which emerges around these sorts of things, hospitals, orphanages, schools. That's that idea of a local political life um, uh, embodied as well. So evangelical religion is another big part of this, um, still is a big piece of our of our identity. If you think about the Trump demographics specifically, you know, we have about 25 to 28 percent of our population today, which is which is um, connected to evangelical religion. Evangelical religion is this idea that you're trying to bring your religion to other people. So it's becoming very much part of that society. So the democratic culture and the market revolution kind of go together. So if you look at how this this uh, transformation occurs with the level of the individual, you think about George Washington. You know, George Washington was really a very much a byproduct of the 18th century. He was you know stood around. Um, in his dress, with his dress sword, his formal clothes, uh, very much about this sort of idea of classic virtue. And, you know, he was himself obviously born to the plantation. And um, while he had some upward mobility, he, he, most of his class status was, was uh, came uh, both from where he came from and also from the fact that he was, um, uh, you know, married into it. Now, Andrew Jackson, on the other hand, represents this kind of Tocquevillian world um, because Andrew Jackson was was really born uh, to nothing. I mean, he was he was a guy who was raised um, uh, you know, on the frontier, uh, trained in the use of guns as a young man. Uh, he was an orphan in, in, in the Carolina mountains, lost his whole family when he was young. Um, his. Uh, his success was really defined by by his military experience. But, you know, as a young man, he was known for gambling, drinking, cockfighting, horse racing. He duels twice, gets shot once in the heart, still lives, you know, after a, 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 a bet on, on horses um, went badly. Uh, he, he was not only known for heavy drinking, but he would often get into fights with his friends um, in the local pubs. Uh, they thought it was a really good time to throw all their, uh, their glasses into the fireplace at the end of a, of a fun night and then sometimes even go after each other um, with the broken glass and sometimes with knives, sometimes even shooting each other. So, again, when Andrew Jackson became president, people were just absolutely shocked because this is not the kind of person uh, that people thought could make it to the presidency. I mean, you, you didn't have all of the social status and the the, the, the kinds of background and, and education that Madison did, and Jefferson did, and certainly George Washington did. Uh, and even his, his predecessor, John Quincy Adams, who was a Harvard professor, everybody thought that's what made you president. But in this new world that Tocqueville is seeing, anybody can be president, anybody at all. Uh, so Andy Jackson, the guy from the frontier, you know, this is this was a whole new ballgame. So this is really what defines 
uh, Jacksonian democracy and the world that Tocqueville sees, a highly fluid, dynamic, democratic culture, which still is very active today.